Okay, thanks a lot um, for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation and the organization of the conference to Jeremy, Joost, Hermann and Marcel. It's, for us, it's a great honor to be here. And it's, indeed, it's a, let's say it's the first time to discuss our concept in an explicitly historian, uh, historical context. That means with historical, with historians. And it's also a further step into, let's say, the internationalization of the discussion of our concept, which we are very happy about. Yeah, thanks for this and for organizing this. And I think it's very complex um, conference in technical terms. So besides from uh, discussing with all of you here, it is also for me personally a further step in uh, digital learning. And that was, let's say, um, um, it was intensified by the Corona crisis. But this kind of complex blended conference is the first one that I have. And I think I'm very curious about how it, it will go. Yeah. Um, I think you can see my screen and um, the imperial mode of living and the political ecology of labor is the subject of the presentation, the common presentation by Uli and myself. I will present the concept of the imperial mode of living in a more general way and then hand over to Uli who will um, embed it a bit more in the context of the papers that have been delivered for this conference and create some um, references between uh, what we are doing and what has been written in the papers, where are commonalities, where are differences, and where are points that we should discuss in the further course of this conference. Yeah, to start with, I would like to proceed in four steps. First, I would like to introduce the concept of the imperial mode of living. Secondly, I would have uh, would like to have a look on this concept or on the imperial mode of living from a historical perspective. And that also would mean to um, look more specifically on the inclusion of workers into the imperial mode of living of the global north. Third, I would like to talk about the crisis of the imperial mode of living and thought about some perspectives of, um, let's say, um, overcoming relational inequalities in uh, favor of international solidarity. To start with the first point, the imperial mode of living, and um, I think this picture you, you can see here, is uh, something which has to do with production and consumption patterns. And in particular, this is one thing that we also addressed in our book for, with automobility, not only automobility, also with food, with clothing, with a lot of other examples that have also been addressed in the other papers. But what we uh, focus on in our book is more the, the issue of automobility. That means the production, the use of automobility, the normality to move around with a car in northern, but also increasingly in southern societies. And um, our question that we um, wanted to address with this concept is, how does it come that um, in a time of ecological crisis and not only of an ecological crisis, but also of a rising consciousness on this ecological crisis. People increasingly move by car. For example, at the moment we experience an SUV boom, yeah, these sport utility vehicles that enter the cities where they don't have any use value because you do not need such a big car to move around, but everybody wants to have such a car. And they are about to um, uh, achieve a share of about 50% of the new um, sold cars in, in, in many countries. Yeah. We wanted to make sense of this. We wanted to make sense also of a more um, recent um, um, event that one could observe in the Corona crisis, um, that's with which we start our paper. In, in Germany, there has been a, a fiscal stimulus package by the government. Yeah? And this stimulus package, of course, addressed particularly the automobile industry because it is a, the main or one of the main industries in Germany and one of the main pillars of the German export model. Mm -hmm. Many people expected that this fiscal st stimulus package would also include um, premiums for um, cars, for buying cars with a combustion, with an internal combustion engine. But this did not happen. There are premiums for electric cars, but not for um, cars with an internal combustion engine. And many were surprised and 
This was criticized not only by the automobile industry itself, but also by trade union representatives, by the German metal workers trade union. Of course, one could say it's not a surprise, but on the other hand, the German Metal Traders Union had begun to address ecological issues in more recent times. It had begun to talk about social ecological transformation. It had begun to create alliances with other social actors in order to think about how to foster social ecological transformation. And against this background, it struck us a little bit that the critique of this fiscal stimulus package because of the omission of cars with a combustion engine was that strong and that the IG Metall indeed was very disappointed by the social democracy that was responsible for this fiscal stimulus package as part of the coalition government in Germany. How can we make sense of this? We thought that the imperial mode of living can help us to understand this, but also can help us to think about how to overcome this, yeah? how to overcome this constellation that workers obviously, or trade unions obviously, are much in line with a very resource and emission intensive model of production and consumption that damages people in other parts of the world and that burdens future generations. And to go a bit more into depth, let me name some um, features of this mode of living. In, on a more general um, level, we would define the imperial mode of living as unsustainable patterns of production and consumption that are based on an unequal appropriation of nature, that means of resource and things, ecological things that, for example, absorb the CO2 that is emitted by economic activities, and the unequal appropriation of labor power on a global scale. And if we talk about labor power, we mean both paid and unpaid labor, reproductive labor, care work, mainly done by women that is seen as a invisible and invisible, but also an indispensable precondition of producing and of capitalist accumulation. Unsustainable patterns of production and consumption that imply wealth increases and the lowering of reproduction costs in the global north that produce enormous social and ecological costs and at the same time render them invisible through externalization in space and time. The costs are externalized and they are not visible. You know, if you buy a car, you do not see under which conditions the resources, the raw materials that are built into this car have been extracted. What are the labor conditions? What are the ecolog ecological destructions? Of course, a car and the car advertisement highlight completely different aspects of this car. Autonomy, freedom, liberty, masculinity, and so on. Yeah. This is highlighted in the other features, the dark features of car production and car use, of course, are made invisible. Unsustainable patterns of production and consumption that, because of this, cannot be generalized from a social ecological point of view. So they need, let's say, an external sphere. They need an external sphere because they are based on an unequal appropriation, on a disproportional appropriation of nature and labor power. And thus, if everybody does this, if every country comes to a state of development of the capitalist economy that needs, that depends on such an unequal appropriation, the resources and the labor power of the earth will not be sufficient and the ecological progress will even more accurate than we have it um, at uh, that we have it right now. The imperial mode of living is not an issue of attitude and individual choice. It's not that we are rooted in mere consumption research or that we think about that you are rooted in a, in a methodological individualism in certain lifestyle and ideas where people might, may, might be um, uh, seen as consumers that possess a certain autonomy or sovereignty and are free to choose a certain commodity or not to choose it or to choose a commodity that is environmentally more friendly and another one that is not environmentally friendly. That is not our, our point. Our point is that these imperial mode of living and the patterns of production and consumption that are, the, are at the heart of it are deeply rooted in everyday perceptions, in practices, in institutions, in infrastructures, infrastructures and in the social relations of capitalist patriarchal societies. So 
if it is so difficult for workers to um, in the global north to um, to refrain from um, from uh, exploitative and um, production and consumption patterns in a global scale, yeah, then this has structural causes. Yeah. It is not something which, with which we would like to blame workers in the global north, but what we would like, what, what we want to understand is what are the social preconditions, what are the social relations that simply force people into the imperial mode of living. Regarding workers, it's quite clear, because in capitalism, is, they do not have anything or they have less more to sell than their labor power. So they have to sell their labor power and they also have to sell it to get a job in an industry that relies strongly on the exploitation of the global south. So it's a structural issue. The imperial mode of living is structurally anchored in the institutions, infrastructures, everyday perceptions, practices of capitalist patriarchal societies. Nevertheless, it is also very attractive yeah, because it enables us to um, lead a good life, to lead a life of the high level of material consumption, to travel around. And of course, it's on the one hand, it's a force, yeah, but on the other hand, it's also a promise, a promise that is very attractive for many people around the globe. The imperial mode of living, thus, is also not a moral category, but a category of hegemony theory. Yeah. What we would like to understand is how everyday life is connected with overarching social and international structures. And what we would like to do is to reveal the invisibilized preconditions of capitalist production and consumption patterns. We would like to contribute to an understanding of the relational inequality and the structural obstacles to international solidarity. So, so far to my first point on the imperial mode of living and in, a more, um, in a more general level. My second point is the imperial mode of living in a historical perspective. And as you can see here, we um, draw, um, among others, of course, um, on the book by Timothy Mitchell on, on carbon democracy, political power in the age of oil, also in the age of coal. <laughs> We consider this term, this concept of carbon democracy, quite interesting in order to understand how is it that workers are also involved into the imperial mode of living, that they are structurally involved into this mode of living. In his book on carbon democracy, Timothy Mitchell describes the rise of the fossilist energy regime, and he describes this, this energy regime as very ambivalent thing. The increasing reliance of capitalist societies on coal meant for the workers also an increase in their organization and production and, 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 and productive power, yeah. production power. So um, coal is a form of energy that is extracted from central um, sites, from central minings, from central mining, and that is distributed about uh, over um, infrastructural networks that are highly centralized. So for workers, it is quite easy to interrupt the provision of society with coal. This was the new power resource that workers achieved in the time when capitalist societies transformed in a way that their energy provision was increasingly based on coal. And they used this. They used this production power, they use this production power in order to fight for an extension of their political and social rights, of their participation in a mode of living, in forms of consumption that up to this point in time were simply forms of consumption of the upper class of capitalist societies. With the coming of oil and with the transformation um, of, let's say with the transition towards oil as the principal energy source of society, this changed because oil is not a source that can be extracted from central mining areas. It's more dispersed and the infrastructures are not that, that they can simply be used for interrupting the energy supply of society because it is more network-like. But nevertheless, oil revolutionized the everyday life of workers in Fordism. 
So we found here a certain, let's say, an, a development that is based on a change in the energy regime that via the struggle for social and political rights included the workers in the imperial mode of living. There was an integration of large parts of the modern working class in the imperial mode of living. There was, if you want so, a processing of the class conflict in the global north at the expense of environmental destruction. Because we know that burning coal is very problematic. It's the main cause of climate change. It is a processing of the class conflict at the expense of neo-colonial north-south relations and at the expense of patriarchal gender relations. Fordism is also a phase in a period in capitalist development that is um, characterized by extremely patriarchic gender relations with the, um, with the men going to, to, to work and the, the uh, women doing the housework, the reproductive work, the care work. This is inscribed in space if you consider the, the uh, the, the, the functionally separated uh, city you know, with the working place at the center with the suburban living spaces, suburban or uh, let's say spatial division um, that is, uh, is the, how many times, how much? 18 minutes. 18 minutes, okay. And you're at the second point? In the second point, yes, the, the next points are shorter, yeah. But okay, so let me uh, uh, stop here with the second point, yeah. And this, I was at the end of the second point. Um, what we are experiencing now is a crisis of the imperial mode of living. And I think this crisis is very well symbolized in this graph by Will Steffen and others about the so-called great acceleration. Yeah. Um, with great acceleration, Will Steffen belongs to, this, to these people who have researched on, done research on the Anthropocene and the planetary boundaries. And their finding is that um, that there was a great acceleration in resource use, in in certain in the consumption of certain goods, in GDP, foreign direct investment, and so on, from the mid 20th century onwards, so that one can date the beginning of the Anthropocene, this human influenced epoch of the Earth history, at the beginning, at the mid of the 19th, 20th century. Yeah. We also have, um, we all know that um, uh, we, we are facing a process where and developing countries are um, um, increasingly um, with the spread of um, certain resource and emission intensive production and consumption patterns to developing countries is intensifying. This is symbolized by this graph where we see the emission, um, the, the CO2 emissions of China and the US and the change that has happened in the last decades. But I would have to talk a bit about this graph. I don't have the time for this, but maybe we can do this in the discussion. What we see here is that there is an increasing um, yeah, spread of this unsustainable patterns of production and consumption, and this has severe consequences. I said before that the imperial mode of living is based on exclusiveness. So it needs an external sphere to which it can shift its destructive social and environmental costs. But this inclusiveness is increasingly threatened by the rise of developing countries. What we are experiencing today are eco-imperial tensions over resources and things. I think one cannot explain the tensions between US and China simply with ecological, ecological questions, issues, but nevertheless, they play a major role in this aspect. So they, these tensions between these two superpowers are also over resources and things. And so they, they signify um, a, a threatened exclusiveness of the imperial mode of living. We are facing an increasing class, uh, we are facing increasing class contradictions in the global north itself. Points that have been addressed in the papers by, by John and Ben, and, and we will go, we will certainly discuss this. And um, so we are facing a contradiction or increasing contradictions of this imperial mode of living that raises um, certain challenges for workers, but also societies in a general worldwide. And this is my last point. What, what are the perspectives? What are the consequences? What are kind of strategic consequences that one can draw from this? In particular, what are the strategic con consequences for workers and their um, um, political strategies? And there is a certain 
term in the debate about social ecological transformation that is very much anchored in the labor movement is the term of just transition. Yeah. Just transition addresses the fact that the env environmental crisis has become a social issue in the global north too. It is, it's all, it, I think it, it, it stands for a progress in environmental consciousness in an attempt to link social and ecological issues. But at the same time, it has a certain shortcoming in that it threatens to concentrate on the distributional effects of the environmental policy rather than on the environmental crisis itself. We can see this currently in Germany, for example, where there is the discussion about the coal phase out. You know, the coal phase out is necessary. We cannot doubt this. But nevertheless, the minor trade union tries to slow it down, even to prevent it. Yeah? It doesn't play a very progressive role in this progress. Yeah? So they are not so much concerned with the environmental crisis, but with the measures that are taken to fight the environmental crisis. Yeah? And this could be a kind of shortcoming of just transition. If trade unions talk about just transition, it is about how to shape the measures to fight the environmental crisis in the way that workers are not so much affected by this. And I think we must go a step further. We will have to talk about a more fundamental social ecological transformation, about different patterns, patterns of production and consumption that really are sustainable in a way that they both um, care for more reflexive societal nature relations and for more sensible, for mean, meaning, more meaningful work for workers worldwide. Because we know that much work that is done is not meaningful from the perspective of those who really do it. Yeah. So what we argue for is a transformation in the direction of use value orientation, to think about what is really needed for a good life. What do we need for a good life and how can we produce it in a way that does not harm the environment, that does not harm other generations, that does not harm people in the globe itself. This is strongly connected with politicizing the question of private property. Yeah. We have to politicize this. I think this is a very important question. We, so attempts of, of use value oriented production in the past. Yeah? If you imagine, for example, the, um, the Lucas Aerospace case in Great Britain in the 1970s, I think this is a very important experience of the working class. Yeah? It, was an, an it, it was an experience that showed that workers indeed are interested in producing goods for society that don't simply sell themselves, but that help society to have a better life goods in the health sector and public transport for renewable energies and so on. But this experience failed and it failed because of private, because of private property, because of capitalist property relations. So we should talk about this. We should, about, talk, we should talk about private property and economic democracy. And this would be my last remark. And we should think about strategies of radical reformism, a term that was developed by Joachim Hirsch in the 1980s, um, in order to um, get out of this, um, let's say, great divide of the 20th century between social democratic and um, revolutionary accounts to uh, capitalism that both failed in the 20th century, and to find a way that combines the positive aspect of both, that think about projects, about concrete projects that are very, let's say, um, the, whose necessity is clear to everybody, or at least to a majority of society, but that indeed contain, a, let's, say, let's say, a certain utopian perspective that make the utopian, the socialist society that we are fighting for, very concrete in the everyday practices, that made it experienceable in the everyday practices of today. There are a lot of examples for this. I think the example of Lucas Aerospace is one. Yeah, they did so. Yeah, there are other examples that maybe I can we can talk about in the discussion. So far from my side, thanks for your attention, and with that, I hand over to Uli. So, Uli, please go ahead. Okay, I'm. Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Also from my side, many thanks to the organizers. And um, I'm very happy to be here into this experiment, a thought experiment and um, experiment how to get together. Um, I just want to add in five to eight minutes some aspects um, referring already to other papers, not to discuss the other papers. We will have time for this, but to 
start our dialogue and to um, clarify maybe from the very beginning what might be misunderstandings um, with our approach. One point is that um, in John's papers that the improper mode of living, he argues, is in a profound crisis. Uh, Marcus already referred to this. The second is um, Marcel's periodization of two phases. Then some thoughts about a conjunctural analysis, where where are we now, and uh, questions of strategy. And then a very last thought on uh, the very notion of international solidarity, the distinction also made by John between economic and political uh, struggles. So what I would like to stress again is, um, when I was reading Marcel's paper and your um, research agenda at the very end, your first point is that we need more detailed knowledge about working class consumption patterns. Yes, this is very important, but we wouldn't reduce it to this. We would argue in line with regulation theory, you might know uh, Michel Alietta's masterpiece from 79, he calls it a norm of consumption. And the norm of consumption for Alietta is the mode of living of the wage earners. And the mode of living of the wage earners is not consumption patterns. It's um, how do they work? How do they live? How do they refer to infrastructures, the role of the welfare state and others? And this is our entry point. And in the German debate, it was very often a misunderstanding to reduce the norm of consumption to, to the consumption pattern. We argue with consumption pattern, but we would like to embed it into Thank you, that's better. And into um, production relations and others. And so we need to study transnational, transcontinental supply chains and working conditions in the global south, but we need a more comprehensive, since we are starting this debate now, we need a more comprehensive understanding even of societies of the global north. The second is uh, John's question um, is, isn't the improvement of living in a profound crisis? And we would argue, I hope this was already clear when Marcus was speaking, yes and no. The imperial mode of living is causing the crisis, the great acceleration after the Second World War, yeah, and with Will Stephen is causing the ecological crisis, also certain north-south splits, but it's also a form to deal with the crisis. At the cost of nature, there are new forms of compromising. If we look at the Chinese middle classes in Latin America, resource extractivism, yeah? resource extractivism, particularly during the so-called pink tide, the progressive governments enabled a certain compromising at a societal level, but it deepened um, the destructive societal nature relations, yeah, because mining was uh, intensified and so on. So um, we would argue it's both, it's a yes and no, and um, um, referring again to John, we would ins like to insist that the imperial mode of living is not there, at not, non -there, not non there, it's a structural category. It's a, how we look at capitalist, imperial, patriarchal, um, racist societies. It's like a habitus from Bourdieu, if you like. It's a category, how we look at the world, and it's not that the imperial mode of living is here, it's not here. Modern capitalist societies always, ha they produce, they, they base on the condition of the imperial mode of living. So it's contested, of course, it's crisis written, it's crisis deepening, but it's also the level of compromising, of societal compromising in the global north, Fordism, and now also in the global south. A third brief thought is um, Marcel's periodization. I won't go into detail. You say it's the first phase, 1840 to 1930, and then Fordism and post-Fordism, um, the 1940s to present. Only one aspect, because this is very important for alternatives. We argue in our book, which will come out in English in, um, in next uh, January, um, that the 70s, the crisis of Fordism, was a first window where practices, discourses of... Oh, Thank you. Of um, a solidarity mode of living, how we call it, yeah, became visible. That at, in the crisis of Fordism, in the crisis of post-war capitalism, there emerged practices, alternative economies, a certain critique of, a, of a disciplining state and others, the critique of the North-South um, 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 division of labor. Yeah, the, the whole debates of a global, um, uh, an alternative global division of labor. So our point is that we, when we, you are the historians, we are not the historians, but if we want to um, formulate a research agenda, it would be very interesting to look in this, in this, into this period of the 1970s, what emerged, 
what alternative, the UNCTAD, for example, the, the, the UN um, Center for Transnational Corporations, which was a major, at least symbolic step to rethink the world order, which we want to rethink when we talk today about post-capitalist societies. Um, then a thought on, uh, on more on the conjunctural analysis. I hope it became already clear in Marco's um, exposition that we need more understanding what, about what we call eco-imperial tensions. What are the eco-imperial tensions? We argue that the, the mechanisms to externalize problems, that problems, crises take place elsewhere, is already crucial and will become more crucial in the maintaining of hegemony. So the, now um, um, the, the, the migrant crisis, the refugee crisis, yeah, is um, a, 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 a maintenance of the imperial mode of living, of course, yeah, that people cannot migrate, that people have no chance to get to Europe to, to make their living here. Um, and um, how these eco-imperial tensions will evolve and how can we understand them uh, better? And um, yeah, I, I leave some aspects out. We have, will have time during the whole day. Maybe also insisting what Marco said on um, radical reformism. We would, Gramsci didn't coin this term. It's uh, our term, if you like. But we should um, develop a perspective of counter hegemony. And to overcome a bit this dichotomy, very strong in the, in the, in the historically in the left, of oppressors and oppressed, kind of a dichotomization of, uh, of social struggle and of politicization, and to understand better what are the varied forms, the, the enormous variety of struggles of contestation um, um, in, uh, in our um, societies. And this is why we start our paper with this example of the scrapping bonus. It's not capitalism and the alternative. What is what we are experiencing now, and this is, if you like, the terrain of struggle for a post-capitalist left or a socialist left, is the very strong tendencies of an ecological modernization of capitalism in the global north. Yeah? The shift to um, electro-automobility is a major step in the modernization of capitalism, but it's not the old capitalism. It's to try to find an answer to the ecological crisis, but under the conditions of, of, of capitalism, of um, um, imperialism, and so on. So this, this would, is also important for the conjunctural analysis. And I finish um, my uh, brief thoughts on the concept, our crucial concept of the conference, which is solidarity. So Marcel's starting point, and I find this really interesting, are we, is relational inequality. Or John calls it a global apartheid mediated by capital labor relations. And, and your first phrase I was, uh, I think was real, what is real international solidarity about? And we, we agree that solidarity in, traditionally in the left is also a question of empathy, is a, qu a question of to understand what's going on elsewhere and to organize um, uh, uh, solidarity with the apartheid movement with others. But, and this is important, yeah, a full stop, this is really important. But coming from an analysis of the imperial mode of living without wanting to blame workers um, and arguing that the imperial mode of living is structurally anchored, then our argument is that the crucial leverage point, the crucial also point of analysis for an international solidarity is to change the living conditions, to change the social conditions, how, is, how people live here. I hope you get the point. We need this, we call, could call it interpersonal or explicit solidarity. We are in solidarity with struggles, of course. But our point would be solidarity means if a solidary mode of living is not to live at the cost of others and at the cost of nature. Solidarity means to create here conditions that we don't must live at the cost of others. Yeah, it's not a choice, as Marco said. It's not a choice to live in the imperial mode of living or not. But what is what we call in recent details um, um, infrastructure socialism? Infrastructures that are created in ecological terms and not um, um, uh, for capital accumulation. Yeah? What are other divisions of labor yeah, in solidarity? Or what is the public sector? The public sector, which is much more um, focused to create use values than, than um, exchange values than, the, than, than private capital, of course. So I hope you, that you get the point. We, have to, we should rethink or enhance our understanding of solidarity, that solidarity is a practice 
not only an, 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 a, a conscious act, it's a practice that enables people, workers, wage earners here in the global north, but also in the global south, also in Beijing, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, etc., etc., Johannesburg, that people don't have to live at the cost of others and the cost of nature. This would be our crucial point for a reformulation of solidarity. What does it mean then politically? We have also time to discuss. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here um, and also discussing all these papers. Um, so I, I will give uh, some uh, appraisal of the contribution in the in the, in the more general uh, context of the workshop, and then some remarks and questions for for the authors, but also in general for the rest of the of the workshop. So I, I I take it that as uh, Marcel introduced in the in the introduction and also in the text, uh, the, the the topic of the workshop is very critical in in the sense that it's the most critical question that there can be. Why is the working class fragmented? And and this of course opens up a different lines of division that as labor historians I also we are also acquainted with in terms of skilled uh, and unskilled workers, gender differences, of course, national differences, race, religion. Uh, that is the fragmentation of the working class. The strong point of this conference is that it reminds that this fragmentation cannot be understood only in terms of ideology, but in terms of it's rooted in material divisions. I think that's the most one of the most critical points of, of the conference that I want to stress out. And in particular, the, the workshop is focused on these material differences in terms of what the organizers call the North and the South, um, the, and what is here called relational inequality. So as Marcel said, the fact that some people are better off because others are worse. And, and the, uh, Ulrich and, and Brandt, just the, the, the um, sorry, Marcus and Ulrich, uh, approach the problem in this general problem, with the concept of imperial mode of living. I think the specific contribution of the paper we just they just presented is um, that of course they include the ecological question. That's very clear also from the title. And I think it's very important. I, I quote, they say that the, the imperial mode of living concept explains the hegemony of the reproduction of production and consumption patterns that imperial more equal, solidarity and sustainable. So that's my emphasis. And they also say, that we should not live at the cost of others and at the cost of nature. So I think one of the critical contributions of this paper for this debate is that they pose the question of living at the cost of others, which is the, the main topic of the of the workshop in terms of this relational inequality, but also at the cost of nature. So this this two uh, so you bring up this point and, and, and that opens up a lot of uh, questions, but I think that's a, a very important uh, contribution. And they, uh, they also, as, as you pointed out, you two in the presentation, this also brings up extremely important political topics for now and also in the history of the labor movement, because as you say, it is a dilemma in very many occasions that, uh, so to say, ecological demands clash with uh, more immediate demands. So to put it simply, if you close a factory uh, or an energy plant that is polluting, that means that people lose their jobs. And uh, you, you, I will, I will uh, say something else about this later, but this, of course, you pose it as a problem in the global north, but it's extremely more so also in the global south. Uh, these ecological demands going against immediate and not so immediate uh, interests of the, of the working class. And... Uh, <clears throat> And, and in the end, also the the the, the YouTube the, they present this idea of just transition and, and the idea of radicalization of the just transition and 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 now you just introduce also this idea of uh, radical reformism um, that is not oh, I didn't find in the in the text but you it makes sense with the whole uh, argument now it's now that you mentioned it it all uh, falls into place. So for all this, I think the, 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 the questions you pose here are very important for the debate further today. And, and in general, I think no discussion nowadays can uh, go without including the, the, the ecological question uh, in terms of the, the, the challenges for emancipatory movements that they have to discuss. And, and you are not, uh, your paper also is important, it's, it's not naive in that, it just poses the dilemmas and the, and the problems that it, that it poses. I have um, a number of remarks uh, slash questions uh, for to push you a little and, and to promote the debate. More in general, uh, 
for you, but also for the workshop, I think we will have to discuss um, what is specific about this kind of inequality. So we know what is specific about the gender inequality, the race inequality, what is specific about the relational inequality? Because to me, it's not enough to say global south and global north, because it's a geographical euphemism that is not very clear what it means. What is north and what is south? Because of course it's clear to us that we are not talking about geography, but then what are we talking about? Are we talking about imperialism, imperialist countries and oppressed countries or dependent countries? If that's so, where is the line? Um, third world was, uh, and also to point out that uh, global south it is not an indigenous term in the global south. Nobody will say global south in the global south. Uh, third world is an indigenous term. It's a word that can be used even with proud, with pride in the global south as part of the movement. I'm not saying that it might not happen in the future, but usually uh, this needs to be at least put in the table and say, okay, where, what, is the, what is the line? Where, so Marcel says, okay, workers in the north live off of uh, workers in the south. Where is exactly the, now, the line between north and south? Where does it cross? Um, of course, I'm not just saying anything original here. I just want to, to, to put it in the, in the, in the agenda. Second, uh, more a question that uh, I would like you to push you a little to elaborate further. Uh, you don't include too much the uh, consequence of such an ecological agenda for the workers in the global south. So how do you think uh, this will work out in economies, not sectors, but whole countries that are heavily dependent on so say polluting uh, um, exportation because i have the impression that this kind of agenda has the also deepens the gap between movement or emancipatory movement on the north and the south because it brings more together the workers in the south to their nationalist slash populist governments who are more uh, strongly defenders of their uh, commodity production so if you go to uh, Argentina and say that we don't have to produce soy anymore, many people say, yeah, true, because the ecology is, but the, the people say, okay, what do you want us to do? Uh, we, we, we already don't have any dollars and we will have even less dollars and the, the whole economy will go bankrupt. Uh, so it's not just one sector. It's, uh, and, and, and that can be said about Venezuela and oil production and many others. Uh, um, and the relationship between the workers in the global south and the nationalist, uh, I'm, I'm using the word nationalist in the, in the more general sense, so you can also say populist, however you want to name it, uh, movements in, the, in these countries. In more theoretical terms, also to push a little here and to bring up the discussion for later, uh, the, the, by bringing up the question of ecology, also we need to, to we can discuss the question of Marxism and the relation uh, with uh, ecology. Because I wanted to push a little also on this. You say, what does it mean to live at the cost of nature? Because in a way, we always live at the cost of nature. There's no way that we cannot live at the cost of nature. Um, so maybe the question is, uh, we don't want to live at the cost of nature in such a way that we are endanger endangered as humans, but nature is endangered anyway by, by our mere presence in the planet. So in a pure bi biological way. I don't know if it's more philosophical, my point, but it is, if it's at the cost of nature, we might as well just disappear. Um, we're not exactly saying at the cost of nature. Maybe what we want to say is something more sustainable for us as humans not for nature, because nature is not <laughs> interested in, uh, and, and the, or the planet, the planet will survive even if we make a total disaster uh, as, as a mass of rock, let's say. Uh, so what kind of balance with nature are we looking for? And I'm not having the answer, I'm just, just placing the, the, the question. And also this means that we have to further discuss the anthropocentric approach that is critical to Marxism because, um, and socialist movement, because we, uh, in, 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 in always uh, we are considering uh, Marxism and socialism is considered the development from the point of view of the human beings. And uh, to finish up, uh, you are, uh, I think, the, one of the most critical points uh, of that we can debate today. You, I'm happy that you brought up in the end this idea of radical reformism because also this uh, gets together. Uh, because you mentioned a couple of times that this imperial mode of living is attractive to workers in the sense that, yeah, it's a better standard of, of living in such a way. 
So I think the, the question uh, I would like to pose here is that, how do you see the relationship between uh, emancipatory struggle, struggle as a moral principle or a material oriented principle? So to say, we, we fight for a better world because it's moral and it's ethical or because we can not survive in this one. And I think that relationship between those two is very critical in the history of socialism. Bernstein, for instance, when, when he argued against Kowski, that, that was one of the core of the arguments. It's, it's a principle, it's not that there's a material, it's a, it's a moral principle, uh, a good moral principle indeed. Uh, that, so you, you mentioned in the end this solidary uh, mode of living, and you said the, the imperial mode of living is not a choice, agreed. Is the solidary mode of living a choice that we can just pre-create um, the conditions of a better society in this society? I don't know if I make myself clear. So to, to what extent is this uh, an ethical approach? Because it might be, it might be that what we're talking about is, do, is, is uh, this solidary mode of living implying uh, going against the material interest of workers in the global north. Is it so? Because if it's so, then it's a, it's a big change uh, in the history of the emancipatory movement. We're, we're telling uh, some workers that in order to be solidary with others, they might need to go against some of their material uh, interests. Then we can argue, yeah, this is not your real material interest. This is just what capitalism told you. This was material interest. Etc. 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 And this is, in a nutshell, the discussion that you said it is posed. Uh, for instance, when they close a factory, and somebody says, "We don't want to close this factory. We don't care if it's polluting," uh, and and that's exactly the the, the core of the process of the problem. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Andy has the floor now. He's not. Uh, you cannot see him because he's somewhere else, but you can hear him, yes? <laughs> All right, I am in London. Um, thank you very much for organizing this conference, which I think is actually an excellent framing of the problem, and it's also a very, uh, hopefully, productive process, so thank you. Um, on the point of the first paper, I think that also in the paper that I read, the, it, the question is posed in terms of the vision between um, capitalism and what lies outside and this actually does hark back to the classical debate about Rosa Luxemburg's reading of the volume two of Capital the Departments of Production and what I want to point out is that one of Marini's contributions was that he pointed out that the Departments of Production which is really tracing how uh, commodities move how they're produced how they're consumed where they're consumed right he basically argued that departments of production are different in the imperialist countries and in the subordinate countries. And so in other words, the question of production consumption patterns, there is a, a political economical uh, tool which Marini sort of developed from Marx. So that's a, a theoretical point because it does seem to me that the emphasis has been on consumption. But if we look at it from the point of view of production, you have to look at capital and the way capital produces commodities and how capital moves them around. Um, secondly, uh, on political strategy, there's a new book just out by David White, who's an author I really like actually, it's called Ecocide, but he also starts from this Luco aerospace model. And what I want to point out is that it was very creative and um, generative of new ideas, but it also had limits. And that's something which is quite important in terms of just transition. Because is the just transition going to be a green industrial revolution, which really just assumes still that the supply of raw materials and food and so on? Uh, or is it a question of um, the use values produced in the global south uh, themselves are no longer sort of available for export? So it's talking about not just a green industrial revolution, but a green anti-imperialist revolution. And just lastly, if I may, just a third point. In terms of solidarity and global apartheid, this is actually very concrete. I mean, the major corporations that were in South Africa 
before are now actually based where I live in London. And they do operate around the world. They are extracting coal from Colombia. There's just coal workers are on strike in Colombia. They're destroying uh, communities in El Cerrojón mine. So the question of uh, solidarity with workers fighting corporate capital and communities fighting corporate capital and its extractivism today, I, I think is a very real one. And it connects the concrete with the sort of the solidarity strategy and makes concrete what I mean by anti-imperialism. We, we you know, need to bring the sort of question of the concreteness of where we go together with the sort of the broader question of political strategy. Andy, can I ask one uh, small clarification about the first point you made? Uh, so you you are saying uh, the Luxembourgism of Uli and Marcus uh, is unnecessary because it is ab about the relationship between uh, uh, sectors one and two, according to capital two, uh, within capitalism. Well, I think Marini took the debate further, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just, just terminology is quite important here. In an English translation, we use the term departments to separate it, to distinguish it from the sectors of all in through. We're not talking about industrial sectors. We're talking no, no, about... I meant departments, sorry. Yes. Yeah, 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 sorry, that's fine. Uh, so what Marini's basically saying is, look, in Latin America, we do not produce the means of production. Okay, so we don't have that department or is it very restricted? Therefore, we have to import the means of production. Therefore, our, the nature of our capitalism is not self reproducing. And this is a, a, a distinction within the capitalist mode of production. Uh, he's also saying, look, I mean, basically, our elites are very, you know, luxury consuming. I mean, the mass consumption of the working class came much later in certainly in Latin America than, than it did in the United States and Europe. So the question of what we mean by workers' consumption is related to what is being produced in different parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. thank you, that's clear to me. Uh, do we have any other questions at the moment, uh, Herman? Yes, please. Joost? Uh, good um, just one point. Mute myself. Yes, there's one point I have to make. The panelists' presence uh, cannot put questions and answers. And so they have to raise uh, their hand if they want to, to react. So that's something for myself to know. Joost has just raised his hand. The same goes for those of you who are not panelists who are present in the room at this, at, at this point. You also uh, simply can raise your hand and uh, ask to speak. And we ask you uh, to speak uh, over there to the, to the left. That's behind you, Joost. Because there uh, you can uh, speak with all the full uh, paraphernalia of uh, a panelist. Because the panelist, uh, there's a panelist view uh, on the computer uh, there at the pulpit. But if, if people have a, have a notebook, they can... Uh, uh, yes, yes, that's true, they can. Yes, yes, yes. Yours is a panelist too. I'm, I'm confusing things. People who are not panelists, but who do want to speak and want to go uh, participate, they are asked to do it over there. And yours can... Uh, uh, can speak uh, on its own. It's it's all new to us and also new to me. So sometimes there's a small uh, small hiccup in uh, in how it works. Yeah, I would. Um, following Herman's uh, latest remark about new technology. Um, I would like to make one comment. Actually, uh, it was Lukacs who, who brought it up, and also the book of Timothy Mitchell. Um, if we analyze the organization of labor as function of the energy sources, coal, oil, nuclear, and what you have, wind energy nowadays, um, you can turn the tables and say, if we want to go for socialist plan economy, what type of 
research, because we don't have it, research is driven by capitalist energy companies. So um, there are strong currents for, say, wind energy, which is very good for contractors, but is thermodynamically uh, not the most, uh, let's put it, uh, uh, efficient way of creating energy and it kills a lot of birds. Um, so what is our industrial policy? How do we develop an industrial policy? And you can take an example of the electrification of the Soviet Union in the 20s, when because there were very bad railways, no coal was coming from the, uh, from the south and they exploited the uh, lignite um, uh, pits around Moscow, which gave it fantastic uh, pollution, but there was no other fuel and they could not get the coal from the Ukraine and the south. So our point is there in analyzing that indeed energy sources codifying the organization of labor, we have to investigate, and I know you have not the answer, but I think it is a point of discussion. Um, if we want another organization of labor, what then has to be the way we distribute energy? And what technologies are needed to develop? So you can say, well, we are against nuclear because the uranium cycle is dangerous and it came out from an atomic bomb, et cetera, et cetera. But is that all there is? And the answer is no, technically speaking. Well, I don't go into details, but there is no long-term research and no long-term idea within the socialist movement of what are the preconditions for reorganizing the type of labor organization we need in, in, this, in an industry what is not oil-based. And at one point, I yes, or Lucas, I seem I completely agree with you. Nature doesn't care. If we blew up the planet, they start again. They did it six times. Well, they, we are now in the sixth time of mass destruction, but um, they did it many times. So there's nothing there of defending nature. It is the fight for the survival of the species, of humans. And if you decide it is not worse because nature tried with the dinosaurs and it failed, and maybe it tried with the humans and it failed, so something, something will new will come up. Our concern is the human species. And that means we have to analyze how to, is the metabolism with nature, with our technology, and what type of technology do we need? Because the critique on oil, the critique on coal, and how it is used in a capitalist environment is only one part of the story. So, um, so that means in the discussion on an industry policy and a research policy, which is, is gone. I mean, it's, it's, it was there before the first five year plan in the Soviet Union, and it went bananas and everybody stopped talking about it. So this is just a comment that we have to take into consideration if we want to define another relationship and another way of the uh, organization of labor in a global natural environment sense. Thank you, Joost. Uh, Thank you, Joost. Uh, uh, is there anybody else who at this moment would like to say something? Hmm? There's nothing in the no, there's Q nothing in the Q&A. So then, Uli or Marcus, uh, you can give a provisional answer and see if some more points come up. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Lucas, most of all, but also to the other question. This is very important and uh, thoughtful. Um, we agree with your critique of this global south and global north, and I work also in Latin America, and, and I know that the term is not used there. Um, um, and we need further concept. We would say at one point it's an empirical question, how, how relations reproduce themselves. And one concept which attracts us currently um, I'm sorry, I have to stop my video now. 
um, which is not in our book yet. It's um, coined by two scholars from Jena, two young scholars, Anna Landheer and Lukas Graf. They uh, do research on Chile and they call it an international internalization society. So uh, Stefan Lessenich and others, they coined the term externalization society. And internalization, internalization society means to look more specifically how the ruling classes, the bourgeoisie, is organizing, the national bourgeoisie, if you like, uh, uh, is organizing um, uh, the international division of labor, the insertion of, um, uh, of Chile, old tradition, but they also insist that the, the workers are also um, kind of integrated into a peripheral mode of living. So I, I leave it here, but this, this, we need more concepts to think this, but then of course it's a question of empirical um, research. The other is what is the consequence of the workers of the Global South? Very important. And we would argue at a general level, then we can go into detail. Um, the question whether you have a, um, a working place, a job in the mining industry, or to lose the job and to lose, the, to lose kind of your, 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 your means of living is what Adorno called a false alternative. A false alternative imposed by mining capital, imposed by the governments of the mining countries. And our tentative answer would be, of course, in Venezuela, which was a kind of an, a, a socialism of the 21st century, a distributive socialism. In Venezuela, almost nobody questioned the oil dependency of Venezuela because it's deeply inscribed since uh, decades. But we would argue um, an, an eco-socialist uh, alternative needs to think, not to say no to the oil uh, uh, um, 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 exploitation and um, selling, needs to think what could be an, an alternative of the political economy. And interestingly, I just come from a, from a um, conference in Wuppertal in Germany on Latin America, interest in there were of course contributions from Venezuela, on Venezuela, interestingly, People around Chavez, not the people in Venezuela, and not the social organization, but people around Chavez started to think, how could an alternative political economy look like? For example, they tried to boost agricultural production in, in Venezuela, a country which imports 70% of, 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 of consumption or consumer products. So this would be a kind of a tentative answer and then to go into detail. And this is also for, um, for Andy, the co-workers in Colombia. Yeah, we would argue, of course, nowadays, the co-workers in Colombia are dependent. They make their living out of coal extraction and selling. But what would be the concrete alternatives? And in the anti-extractivist struggles, there, there emerge alternatives, alternatives of um, um, ecological agriculture, for example. Yeah, there are alternatives. And, and, and to recognize them and to not to say only if we, um, if we phase out mining, we are lost. But what are the concrete proposals by the people, by the movements um, and, and by critical um, uh, thinkers in their countries? Um, just another point, maybe also Marcus will refer to it. Of course, not to live at the cost of nature is a say which is too superficial and, and you also re and refer to this. We would argue to reorganize societal nature relations, or to, to society nature relations, to reorganize them democratically. This is in, in, a, in, a, in the superficial say, not at the cost of nature. And we come from political ecology, and political ecology stresses this, that the appropriation of nature is a capitalist, power-driven, domination-shaped process. It's not nature out there. It's not the planet. Of course, the planet doesn't care what, what is the planet. But how, as you say, how these concrete relationships with nature are reorganized in mobility, in um, housing, in how do we live, how do we close um, ourselves and so on. But this organized in a democratic sense and not via the imperative of capital accumulation. This would, is the entry point of political ecology. Um, yeah. um, I give to hand over to Markus and if there is a point missing, maybe only the, the um, Andy second point, of course, and we are writing on this as well. We are, we are not cheering for a green industrial revolution. We are not cheering for the European Green Deal. The term, I never heard it, but we can think of the green anti-imperialist uh, um, um, revolution. Yes, it's, it, it must go beyond um, an, an, an ecological modernization strategy, which is now so dominant in, uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Yeah, I leave it here and hand over to Markus. Yeah, thanks also from my side for the comments and the, the questions, which are um, indeed very helpful. And at some points we 
already discussed this all uh, in, in our work. So let me um, add a little bit to what Uli has said on the question of living at the cost of nature. I think we have to work with this term of metabolism, of course, and Marx says this in, the, in Capital that the metabolism of nature is a kind of ex a eternal condition of human life. So we have to transform nature in order to, to be able to live. It's, that's no question. That is, that is eternal is completely independent from the modes of production in which people live. But of course, and, and um, Uli has mentioned this, um, there is a certain form of, or let's say, there is a difference between how to organize this metabolism in different societies and production and modes of production. Yeah. Christoph Görg, who has um, written on a theory of um, critical, uh, or critical theory of society nature relations, has worked with um, Adorno and he, or with the early critical theory, and his argument is, uh, the way the um, society nature relations are organized in capitalism is nature domination. Yeah? Nature is dominated when the reproductive cycles of nature and the human body are disregarded, uh, not taken into account. Yeah? And this is what we experience in capitalism. And we have to think about more reflexive ways to organize nature. That means ways that help to take into account the reproductive necessity of other species, but also of, of human bodies, and thereby do not permanently undermine the very ecological conditions of human life. And this, of course, and this is what Joost has um, addressed, is a question also of technology. And what kind of energy technology, what kind of industrial policy do we need? You talked about the type of um, an energy and type of energy technology. I would say the type of energy technology is the one thing. And of course there are disadvantages of, um, for example, renewable energies, in particular the um, wind energy, but nevertheless, this is a form of energy that has, let's say, two advantages compared to fossilist or to nuclear power. On the one hand, it is, um, easier to provide this energy in sustainable ways. And on the other hand, it's easier to provide it in more socially sensitive ways. It is easier to decentralize a renewable energy system in comparison, for example, to a fossilist and nuclear energy system. You can build a, let's say, a, a solar panel on the top of your roof. You can, uh, you can construct a, a windmill as a cooperative, but you cannot, you cannot, um, build, a, let's say, a nuclear plant in the garden of your house. That's not possible, yeah. And luckily it is not possible, yeah. So it's easier to decentralize and make it more democratic in the regime of renewable energies, yeah. That is one thing. And the other thing is, I think we do not just have to talk about the type of energy, we also have to talk about the scale of energy provision. Yeah? And here, the issue of technology and of industrial policy is embedded in an overarching orientation towards, let's say, use value orientation and sufficiency. We have to discuss about how much energy do we need and for which purposes do we want to spend energy? This is a crucial question. Yeah? And if we discuss this, I think the type of energy might not be so much important anymore. Of course, it's still important, but nevertheless, um, then it will be even more possible to satisfy the energetic needs of society via renewable energies that would be indeed socially and environmentally detrimental if we simply replace the energy demand of a capitalist society. I would say in a socialist society, a socialist society would have been constructed in a way, in a way that it uses much less energy than the capitalist society because much forms of industrial production would simply phase out. We do not need them. Last point, and, and again back to, to Lucas, the relationship between emancipatory struggles from a moral point of view and from a standpoint of view of necessity. I think this is a very important point. Yeah. And I would say we have to combine this. I would draw on the concept of moral economy by Edward P. Thompson. Yeah. And they're both things, I think, uh, are included. Yeah? It's a kind of logic that is not the logic of getting ever more, but it's a logic of getting enough for a good, for a decent life. Yeah? So um, it's both a necessity and it is a moral standpoint. And I think we should not underestimate 
workers' consciousness in this respect. So we we had a common research project in in Austria on the. Um, uh, the social ecological transformation and conversion of the automobile sector and also read uh, industrial sociology debates on the consciousness of workers and all the interviews that have been conducted in other projects but also in other pro in our project hint to the point that there is a very deep conviction of many workers that the current industrial model that the capitalist model is not viable that we cannot go on with this yeah? So they see that, and they see the necessity to transform it from a moral point of view, and they see the possibility of a possible road of themselves, because they know they dispose of a certain technologies, they dispose of a certain knowledge, they dispose about, uh, they dispose over the ability to organize complex production processes. Yeah? And this is something that can be used in a social ecological transformation of society. Yeah? And here I think, both the moral point of view and the standpoint of necessity come together. For, the, for those Thank who read German, we have a brochure outside on the, um, uh, a brochure on, on the, the results of this research. Okay. Uh, we now have uh, two more questions. One from, An, uh, from uh, uh, Ben Selwyn and one from Turkel. Uh, first, Ben Selwyn. Is that, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, great. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, very stimulating. Uh, it's just a really just questions of clarification for me because I missed it. Uh, Marcus, you mentioned an author who spoke about uh, capital's relation with nature being one of domination. I just wondered if you could uh, say who that was and what uh, that work was where they referred to it. And uh, more broadly to both. Ben, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, sure, Marcus sure. Marcus cannot hear you. Okay, is that, is that better? Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah. Um, I was just, uh, Marcus, uh, I was just wanting to ask a, a point of clarification because I missed it. Um, you mentioned a, a particular author who talked about um, capitalism's uh, relationship to nature being one of domination. And I just wondered if you could say who that was and what that article or book was. And um, the second point is more broadly, I, was, I mean, you've already talked about it, but can you give some more examples about what a social, I mean, this is to both uh, Marcus and Ulrich. Uh, can you give more examples of what kind of socialist infrastructure would look like? I mean, you know, I was very hopeful uh, prior to December that, uh, you know, Labour's under Corbyn's Green New Deal would uh, start kind of kickstart the processes to where, uh, to where things like this kind of socialist infrastructure would come about. So I'm guessing, uh, am I right to say that uh, that kind of socialist infrastructure could be seen from a radical reformist perspective through a kind of radical Green New Deal perhaps based on degrowth. I mean, you know, one of the problems with Labour's uh, Green New Deal was they were talking about, you know, a green industrial revolution, which it just sounded like an oxymoron to me, which is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, if you combine a Green New Deal with degrowth, redistribution and so on, I think that sounds like the kind of necessary steps. So, I mean, it's just, just uh, an invitation to speak more to that subject. Thanks very much. I very much enjoyed your uh, contributions. Thank you, uh, Ben. And we co continue immediately with Torquil, but you have to come here then. Yeah. To... In the meantime, maybe I can ask another question uh, to Marcus and uh, Uri. Uh, could you say a bit more also about how you see this external arena uh, in relation to the uh, internal, what is it, internalization societies uh, and so on? And how do you see this? And this is also then uh, anticipating Ben Selwyn's paper later, uh, the, the relation between North and South, or internalization and externalization within the North. And, uh, okay, Torto. Uh, well, uh, I think here Ruben is mentioned based on, on uh, history and on, uh, on, on structures. But history and, and, and structures are formed by, uh, by class struggle. Okay, I'll start again. Yeah, he's starting again. He stole the, uh, this, this computer isn't Ah, yes. And the other here. I'm not seeing your nose. 
<laughs> hey, you have to put it on. Okay. Just the microphone. Right. Sorry. It's okay. Well, imperial living is, is as you mentioned, based on, uh, on history and uh, structures. But I think it's important to emphasize that history and, and structures are, are, are formed by, by a class uh, struggle. And indeed, the, the working class in, in Europe and North America fought very hard for imperial living. It was not given uh, to them, they, they fought for it. And I think that you have to include the so-called uh, welfare state into imperial living. The welfare state is part of imperial living and um, the welfare state was made possible by colonialism and uh, im im imperialism. And uh, I think that the working class will continue to fight and defend uh, this part of, of imperial living, uh, the, the, the so-called uh, welfare state. And we see this in, in the movement of right-wing nationalism in, in Europe and in uh, North America. So I think it's very important for our discussion is to focus on, on uh, how and when can this be changed? What will cause a, a change for this fighting? Because I think it's not a question of, of, of moral on, on, on the short and medium run. I, th I think that the workers in the global north will continue to defend uh, imperial uh, living. Thank you, uh, Tokyo. Uh, so now, uh, Uli and Marcus have the final word in this session. Five minutes. No more. So everybody or, or no, the together, together. You are a team. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the name of the author, uh, Ben, is Christoph Görg. Unfortunately, there's not so much translated into English, but we can make available maybe afterwards in the chat. There's a very, very coherent chapter from him in a, in a volume edited by Andrew Bureau um, in Toronto. We can, we can just make it available. Um, I would like to come back to the question, yeah, socialist infra, or infrastructure socialism, maybe it's more precise. Um, ben, you already said it, it's um, close to a radical Green New Deal. It's the idea that the conditions of living are use value oriented and then comes in um, the public sector particular actors and it's not accumulation driven and i'm very sympathetic of both with a degrowth um, uh, perspective um, because this is not degrowth in the sense of shrinking of cheering crises how like in in, in greece in um, 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 some years ago but to have a project a societal political project to get rid of the um, capitalist accumulation imperative, which is which is different. Yeah, it's um, to 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 um, to install another logic of living together. To 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 make it like this. Um, the welfare state question by uh, Torku, uh, your name, Torku, Torku, yeah. and um, um, uh, also others. Yes, we would argue it's it's not very present but we of course with mitchell with timothy mitchell we we our main argument is that uh, the imperial mode of living is a product of struggles and this is the ambiguity and we cannot say like in germany nico Pech is very prominent to say let's get rid of over of, um, um, of um, all the stress and we have to relax and we should be happy that we have now covid 19 that we don't we don't are so inscribed into uh, um, uh, uh, consumption patterns and so on and we would argue no it's um, um the principle of the welfare state the principle of good conditions for everybody and because it's not a choice, an individual choice. This is key. And this, and then we don't have time now. We should think through a good principle of the welfare state beyond the imperial mode of living. To, up to now, the welfare state is based on the imperial mode of living because the, 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 the material wealth comes also through this mode. But what would be another content of the welfare state without um, 
um, without um, uh, denying the principle that people in need have an anonymous uh, mechanism that they are helped in need. This is, uh, I would say, the principle of the welfare state. Um, I'm a bit under pressure because we have only five minutes. I leave it to Markus. Are you prepared to, to answer the other question, the externalizing? Yeah, uh, I think it, yeah. if you have an idea, then just go. Yeah. And I will add some yeah. Maybe the, yeah, um, um, uh, Marcel's point, and um, we will have time to elaborate on that. Um, we are struck to the problem that we have a kind of methodological nationalism, that we look at national formations, that we look at states, and only if we look at commodities, at value change, we, we go a bit beyond. But what we need is a, a conceptual and more empirical understanding, how can we understand these externalization processes? And um, what Andy said, we, don't, we are not Luxembourgians in, in arguing that it's only the, the, the non-capitalist milieu which is conquered by, by the imperial mode of living. Of course, we know it's already commodified social relations elsewhere that become more or less part of the imperial mode of living. But I take your intervention as, an, um, um, as a reminder that we, we need more even methodological um, uh, approaches and um, means how to understand the externalization process and the internalization. I find this a very productive thought by these young scholars that um, it's, it's the other side of the coin and it, it would also kind of um, uh, uh, um, pay, um, yeah, uh, um, uh, criticize our Eurocentric visions that we have to look in, at Chile, at India, at China um, uh, and, and others. Um. Just to add to what um, some one, one thought on Ben's question and the infrastructure socialism, I think the the, the basic idea is to really um, rethink the economy from a completely different point of view. It's not about making profit and maximizing profit anymore, but thinking the economy from the perspective of care and infrastructure provision. That means from the perspective of what we need for living, you know, for, for a good life. Yeah. And I think this is an interesting discussion which is coming up right now. There is the Foundational Economy Collective that has written this book about the economy of the everyday life, which is quite interesting. Uh, I think one could radicalize this approach, but nevertheless, this is a very important um, task that there is, that is this described in this book, the feminist debate on care and thinking the economy from the logic of care and not so much from the logic of producing things that obviously many people just do not need. Yeah? I think this is the big challenge um, for um, a left to do this and I think the corona crisis is also a good opportunity or has shown the very importance of these um, issues that have to be put center stage in the left strategy. In Berlin, we had a, um, a referendum about the re, -private, uh, the re municipalization of the energy provision system, which goes, which went into this direction and which also combined this more radical approach towards a non capitalist society on the one hand and a very concrete measure of reform. So it was an example for, let's say, a Green New Deal or for a measure that is at the same time radical and then the other time it's very concrete and therefore reformist it can be realized but it has a, a utopian potential that points beyond capitalist modes of relation capitalist modes of production because it questions then private property in a very important area of infrastructure provision so this is quite interesting i think this is an area where we have to think about and this leads me to no 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 time is gone I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry. Ich no, okay. uh, with, in 15 minutes we continue with the presentation of John and uh, we will have time to discuss the, your issues also later. Yeah, thank you. So 15 minutes break. Thank you. <laughs>